Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming Sarah Ballantyne. She is the daughter of legendary magician Carl Ballantyne and actress Seal Cabot. I'm having her on the show today to talk about her career in movies and voiceovers. Uh, she was a dancer in Phantom of the Paradise, the classic 1974 Brian De Palma movie that I just love. She also did voiceovers for um, the real Ghostbusters and um, the, Amaz- the, uh, the Spider-Man, uh, the animated series back in the 90s. She was also in the Nutty Professor remake with Eddie Murphy, Frozen Assets, and much more. And I can't wait. It's going to be a pretty interesting conversation, you know, comes from, you know, someone who comes from Hollywood royalty and has made it on her own. Something I really admire in people. Also, I'd like to say rest in peace, James Lipton. As you all know, I do the, um, the slumber party questionnaire at the end of the episodes, and that's a homage to James Lipton's uh, questionnaire. But not really. It became incidental. I didn't have, I still don't have a name for it, but I have options for names and it's kind of, you know, in sync with it. So rest in peace, James Lipton. So uh, yeah, here is my interview with Sarah Ballantyne. Hey, Sarah. Tommy, <laughs> this is modern age. It's amazing. There's phones and there's texting and there's so many ways to like not get in touch with anyone. Yeah. This is great. <laughs> this is working out. Yes. How are you today? Oh, I'm just peachy. Yeah, I'm good. Oh, I'm all good. I worked out this morning and I'm renewing my passport and I'm working on a piece of material to bring to my workshop tonight. And nice. So you're a big part of the day. So there. Oh, thank you so much. Yes, this is um, such a great honor. Thank you for taking the time today. Where is your, where are you? Where are you in LA or are you out of state? I wish I was in LA. I've been Redding, California. Oh, Redding. I've heard of that. (laughs) Yeah. Don't ever go here. (laughs) (laughs) Well, and are you a member of the castle? Is that how you know who I am or? No, I've always been a big fan of your father's and. Oh, Oh, that's so nice. Yes, and, um, you know, uh, various uh, things I'm going to ask you about, of course. And, yeah, so (laughs) that's how I know who you are. Well, tell me, do you, is it a podcast or is it a blog or what is it that you are doing? This is my version of a podcast, yes. I see, okay. And then do you, how do you share it with people? Do you do it on the internet? On YouTube. On YouTube, oh, fantastic. Okay, cool. Yes. So, going back in time, uh, your father was, of course, the great magician, Carl Ballantyne, and your mother was the actress, Seal Cabot. Um, Did they instill in you a a love for performing early on? (laughs) No. I Honestly, I I don't think they... Well, listen, inadvertently, I guess they did, because they were performers, but they were not you know, overly encouraging for me to want to be a performer. When I was a little girl, my mother took me to a Broadway show. Mm -hmm. I was always interested in theater. She took me to see Gypsy. And at the end of the show, when we came back home, I was all excited about it. I was three. And I said, you know, when I grow up, I want to do that. And my mom was so happy. She said, oh, Carl, isn't it sweet Sarah wants to be an actress? And I went, no, I want to be a stripper. (laughs) <laughs> so that was what like, inspired me as a little girl. I thought that was the glamorous career to have. Wow, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> you were sorry, but of course I grew out of that phase fairly quickly. But um, yeah, were... I always wanted to be a performer, I, and I, I didn't even say like an actress. I always said a performer because I like to entertain people. You know, whatever the form is, if it's singing or dancing or acting or just you know, having dinner and being witty. I just like people and I like to make them happy. Yeah. Wow. You were advanced. (laughs) I really was. I mean, it just came out and my parents were awfully cute people. I mean, everybody who knew them 
uh, has wonderful stories about them. They were just fun. They just they just knew how to live. And, you know, we weren't uh, overly rich. They both didn't grow up rich at all. Mm. My dad got a TV series, so that was great. But, um, yep. you know, we, it wasn't about money. It was just about the way they lived life and how they... Just were darling. And my, my dad had been married before, my mother, who had been married to someone that I guess wasn't really a very good person. So mm. he was very gun shy about getting married again. But then he met my mother, who was a comedian and, <clears throat> you know, like a Carol Burnett, uh, Imogene Coca type. Yeah. And just so fun and upbeat. He went, wow, you know, and, and when they came together, that was really the life, the love of their lives, you know, both of them. So yeah. nice. It's so nice, you know. Not everybody has that experience where their parents, you know, really loved each other and really wanted you, and you were really a priority. I mean, these are the gifts I really feel I was given: is that I always was loved and you know appreciated, and always a priority, and you know all that stuff. Um, that what I find with friends and other people, they didn't have that. So whether you're in show business or not, it's really important to feel that you matter to your parents. Oh, uh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, did you spend a lot of time on, on your parents' movie and TV sets? Well, I wish I'd spent more, to be honest with you, because all of the people, my God, uh, my dad worked, you know, he was in Speedway with Elvis Presley. <laughs> he was in The World's Greatest Lover with Gene Wilder. I didn't go to any of these sets. You know, when you're a kid and your parents are working, that's just their job. That's what they do. Mm -hmm. You know, like if my dad worked in an office, maybe once a year I'd go to the office and see what it was like. But in show business, it's kind of the same. It's just their job. You know, he would go to work and my mom would go to work. So I'd hear these great stories, but, you know, I didn't go on the sets all the time. I went to school. I was taking my lessons. You know, I wanted to take tap dancing and singing and ballet and act, you know. So I'm like <laughs> trying to be my own person and I get to have dinner and hear these great stories and oh god my mom she's just so funny she's so adorable she did um Freaky Friday the oh, original yeah Friday. <laughs> she's a teacher and uh you know it starred very young uh, Jodie Foster and Barbara Harris so wonderful and my mother uh, played the school teacher and she had a lot of fun on that job and I guess I spoke to her on the phone. I said, so, Mom, you know, what was it like? How was work today? And she said, oh, I had the most fun, darling. I worked with this little girl, and I think she's a little dyke. <laughs> oh, God. I, I love it. Fine. It was hilarious. Hilarious. Um, and, and Elvis gave us a Cadillac, you know. Mm. Uh, my mother said, oh, please, tell him we don't need that. We have a Mercedes, you know. It's like, Mom, take the Cadillac, for God's sake. And he would buy out the movie theater in Hollywood, yeah. the whole theater, and invite us to come to screenings and stuff. But we never, we never, I never went on the set. I did, didn't meet these people. He did Penelope with Natalie Wood. I would have loved to have met her. Yeah. Monkeys, all these shows, oh, yeah. everything they did. I, it just didn't occur. You know, it just wasn't yeah. a thing. I, I remember when he was on the Monkeys, yeah, and... Uh, I remember when he was uh, one of George Burns' poker buddies and Just You and Me, Kid. Yes, yes, and I love George Burns more than anything. Oh, my God, I love George Burns. Oh, were they good oh, friends? Yes, they were. They shared a love of cigars and funny women. So, yeah, they, they had a lot in common. <laughs> you know, uh, George Burns is really the straight man for Gracie, and uh, my dad is funny as he was. My mom was funnier. It was just the way it was. <laughs> Yeah, he was, uh, he was also one of Billy Crystal's Friar Club buddies and Mr. Saturday Night. Yeah, Billy Crystal loved my dad. And ironically, my little sister, who is not in show business, she's in real estate, mm -hmm. she lives across the street from Billy Crystal. <laughs> and I said, Molly, have you ever gone over and, and said, you know, you're Carl's daughter? And she's like, oh, no, why would I do that? I don't want to bother him. I'm like, I could get a kick out of it, but I understand. You know, sometimes we figure we shouldn't bother these people. Yeah. I hope she does get to meet him someday. I hope so. I, I think he's so... Well, listen, I wish they'd bring him back to host the Oscars. I, yeah, <laughs> he's the best fantastic. host. The best host ever. He was. He was wonderful. Yeah. 
According to IMDb, and we, we don't we, we know how inaccurate IMDb can be sometimes. Uh, when you were twelve, you were on an episode of the John Forsythe show. Yes. When okay, the John Forsythe show was the one where he had the girls' school, and Elsa Lanchester and Guy Marks were teachers. Yeah. At school. This is a short-lived series, but and I think it was on a season or two. But it was what the fun part for me is my first. Well, not my very first. My first job was the Red Skelton show. That was the very first SAG job I got when I was nine. Um, my mom would drop my dad off at Universal at Teratupa at the island where they shot Mikhail's Navy. And then she'd have to drive over to the other side of Universal to drop me off at the set for the John Forsyth show. Mm-hmm. And then she'd go off and have a day. And then she'd have to pick us up because my dad never drove. And this was, of course, before Uber and all of these things. Mm-hmm. So that was a really fun time because we were both working at the same studio. Yeah, and there's also two other um, child actresses in it. Uh, Tracy Stratford, who absolutely refused to be on my podcast. She did? Oh, I just love Tracy so much. She yeah. Did. And Pamela must have done it. Pamela Ferdin did it, right? Uh, she's planning on doing it when her book comes out this year. Yeah, because she's doing a lot of publicity. And listen, she was one of my idols as a kid because she was in everything. And I thought she was the cutest thing ever. Yeah. She just was adorable. She, you know, I was sort of the mature one of the three of us. But we were the three, like, teacher's pets at the school. So we did a couple of episodes. I'm not sure how many, but IMDb probably has it wrong. But somebody sent me a couple of clips. I didn't remember a lot of it, so it was fun to see it. Yeah, and she still has she still has that youthful, exuberant voice in her sixties. Oh yeah, totally, totally. And you know, if she still has those pigtails. I don't know what to tell you because that was <laughs> my. I just love those like corkscrew pigtails or banana curls. They call them that. That this is so cute. Yeah. <laughs> what do you remember about John Forsythe? I love John Forsythe. Well, he and my dad both like the horse races, and I have to just preface by saying the horse races today are not like what they seem to be then. I mean, then there was no horses dying on the track and all of this horrible treatment of animals. It might have been, but we didn't know about it. So it seemed like a really fun sport. It was the sport of kings and, you know, it was fun. And my dad and John Forsythe used to go to the track and he was just so charming and just lovely, lovely guy. And Elsa Lanchester kind of took me under her wing and said, my dear, you're going to be a great Shakespearean actress one day. (laughs) Of course, that's what I wanted to do, too. Um, And I worked with John Forsythe's daughter on the back stairs at the White House. We played, um, uh, gosh, was it Roosevelt's Daughters? I forget which president. It was a miniseries. It was really a good miniseries. uh, All about the, like, the... It was kind of pre-upstairs, downstairs. It was about mm-hmm. the wait staff at the White House. And we played the president's daughters. I just can't remember which president. Oh, gosh. Um, the guy who was the man from UNCLE, Vaughn. Robert Vaughn, yeah. He was the president. I think it was Roosevelt. And we were the daughters. We played the three daughters. Nice. And one of the other daughters was John Forsythe's daughter. Mm-hmm. Nice. And uh, Ann B. Davis, of course, yeah, Alice. Yeah, she was so wonderful, too. <laughs> uh, my mom did Partridge Family with her. Um, she, oh, she, I'm currently involved with a children's theater production produced by Lloyd Schwartz, who's sure which Schwartz's son, who was, of course, the creator of The Brady Bunch in Gilligan's Island. Yep. So I'm involved with uh, Lloyd Schwartz in the children's theater at Theater West that has been going on for like 30 years. Um, it's the best children's theater in town here. Yeah. And Guy Marks, oh, God, he was so damn funny. I remember one time he, <laughs> he was on a Dean Martin roast where he was doing a Native American Indian song with, like, Italian gestures and everything. It was such a scream. Yeah, he <laughs> was pretty brilliant. He was like Sid Caesar in a way, you know? He yeah. Was like the poor man Sid Caesar because he could do all those dialects and accents and sing and just hilarious guy. Hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> How did you get to be a dancer in Brian De Palma's Phantom of the Paradise? Uh, I was a student at Immaculate Heart College, which uh, was a wonderful, wonderful university till it closed, and uh, now it's AFI. 
Mm -hmm. uh, Brian, I think, knew some people at the school. He came to one of our Grotowski workshops where uh, we spent time being trees and snakes and all kinds of creatures. It was a lot of physical work. And the teacher, uh, Bill Shepard, who unfortunately recently just passed away, he was going to be in the film because uh, he knew Brian from Brian De Palma had gone to Sarah Lawrence and uh, there was, I don't know, I don't know exactly all the connections, but I think it was because of Dionysus in 69, which was a Richard Schechner production in New York and Brian loved that and this guy had been in it and now he was running the school at Immaculate Heart. There, how's mm -hmm. that for, you know, recall? <laughs> and we were uh, cast in a movie. That's, uh, he pretty much picked a couple of the people from here. We shot the movie in Texas in Dallas, Texas. But um, I was there for a long time. It was a really fun, really fun gig. Mm -hmm. it was a lot of fun. I loved all those people, you know, Jessica. I thought Jessica Harper was just about the greatest thing since sliced bread, you know. She's just super, yeah. super in that movie. The movie's fantastic. Oh. Every time it's on TV, people, you know, write me and contact me because they see my name in the credits, but yet they don't really know what I did because I'm all through the movie in different makeups and hairs and dancing and all kinds of outfits and, and the, you wouldn't know, but I'm all through it. Yeah. Um, and it was just really fun. And who knew it would be such a cult classic? And they keep trying to make it a Broadway musical. It, it should be a Broadway musical. The songs are great. Yeah, I, I did not know that De Palma directed this movie until the internet came. And I couldn't oh. believe it when I found out <laughs> because I hadn't, I hadn't seen it since I was a kid at that time. It, oh, wow. It, it's such a huge departure for the rest of his career with all these oh, yeah. Hitch, Hitchcock style thrillers and dramatic films with crime overtones. Yeah. You know, this is yeah, a, this was sort of a fanciful thing, but I loved his take, uh, you know, mixing the Phantom of the Opera with a Faust theme. I mean, the whole, it was very creative, you know, and, um, Paul Williams wrote fantastic music and William Finley. Oh, William Finley had been in that Dionysus in 69, Richard Schechner's Performing Garage. And that's pretty, I bet that's how Brian knew him. Yeah. He'd gone to Sarah Lawrence too. I don't know. But, um, and I stayed friends. I stayed friendly with Brian for a while. And, uh, I auditioned for Scarface, a part in Scarface, oh. it, but you know, we stayed kind of friendly and, Oh, it's just wonderful that he's had such success. You know, he's a fantastic director. Yeah, it, it, it's a Rocky Horror Picture st style parody of Phantom of the Opera. Yeah, there you go. That's good. I like that. Yeah. Did you make that up or did you read that somewhere? It's just <laughs> it, it's something I pulled out of my ass. <laughs> I like it. It's very good. Thank you. Yeah, I just... <laughs> I love the movie because it's so 70s and it makes fun of the music industry in the 70s. Yes, yeah, so great. And you know, Garrett Graham, who played Captain Beef, I don't <laughs> know where he is, but man, what a talented guy. He really had, I mean, he had a, a presence and, and a style that I haven't seen in too many people. You know, he really was special, but he kind of disappeared and I don't know why. I don't know where he went. He uh, he was at this convention I was supposed to go to a couple of years ago, but then I couldn't make it at last minute, unfortunately. Oh. But I know oh. I know he does conventions at least once a year or something. Oh, that's good. That's good. Yeah, I love the scene. Uh, I can't remember the situation that well because it's been a while. But like uh, William Finley, he like falls, and and Paul Williams says, "Get that faggot up." <laughs> <laughs> Just couldn't say that today, I guess. Yeah, you can't say that today. <laughs> God. And uh, Archie Hahn, he's so talented. Oh, yeah, he's around. I see Archie sometimes. He's wonderful. I'm... Facebook friends. <laughs> oh, he's on Facebook? I believe so. Oh, because, okay, I'm friends with some of the founding members of the Groundlings that he came up with. Uh -huh. I was a groundling too. Actually, and, I was not a big famous groundling, but I studied with Tracy Newman and Bill Steinkellner for a couple of years, and always, you know, looked forward to one day being a major groundling. But I kind of drifted into other kind of groups. But what, what, what yeah, he was, with, he was there. He was a big groundling. Yeah, because I'm friends with a lot of those groundlings, and they, they don't even know where he is. <laughs> oh really? Oh gosh. Yeah. Um, I'll see if I can find him for you. He usually, I mean, I've, you know, I'm very involved with the Magic Castle, and it's a private yeah. club for magicians, so I can't, you know, invite 
in the world. But um, I no, think I that's the last time I saw him was at the castle. So I'll, I'll find out that. Oh, thank you. Yes. Yeah, I know a few people who are members of the Magic Castle. Cool. You know uh, Kelly Maroney and Daniel Ulin. Sure. Yep. Well, she's great. You must have interviewed her. Uh, yeah, we. I interviewed her at a festival. She's just done so many podcast interviews the last like six years or so. She's just burnt out on podcast interviews. <laughs> oh, I understand. It does get exhausting. I, you know, the thing that people usually want to interview me about is uh, Spider Man. Mm -hmm. I've done so many um, interviews about that, and hope to be able to do some conventions and stuff. I mean, I'd love to be able to go out of town or. You know, they do these autograph shows of people who loved um, the 90s Spider-Man. The first yeah. Spider-Man, you know, with, um, oh, God, uh, you know, oh, <laughs> Christopher Barnes and yeah. Ed Asner and, uh, oh, gosh, the one who was married to Juliet Mills, uh, not Malcolm McDowell. Yes. You know who I mean? Um, yeah. Mm, <laughs> Very bad. Anyway, but that's that's the thing people usually want to talk to me about. So I was surprised you didn't lead with that. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll be asking about it later on. <laughs> I, I'm very linear. I like to go, you know, in order. In I order. See. I get that. Yeah. So wait. So wait. So when were you at the Groundlings studying? Oh gosh, it was, must have been in the '80s because in my class, okay. Yeah, Mindy Sterling was in my class. I've talked to Mindy. She got um, yeah. Austin Powers and. Who else was in my class? Um, gosh, I just know a lot of the people who've gone on. Did you know Cynthia Zagetti? I do. I know her. Yep. Uh, I also studied with her a little privately, um, and she must have done your must have done your show too. No, she, amazing. she she was al she was already sick. I I, I oh. didn't even start it yet. She was already gone when I started it. Uh, oh, oh, I'm so but sorry. She was fantastic. I was a huge I was a huge fan of her and in, in different yeah. things. And uh, one of the founding members, who's a dear friend of mine, Terry Bolo, was best friends with her since high school. Oh, yeah. Terry Bolo. Is Terry Bolo still around? Oh, yeah. She's, um, she was working at that uh, memorabilia shop, uh, Dearly Departed, uh, which oh, just closed. Yeah, I remember. She's did some great things, too. Yeah. She's Show just, business is so bizarre. Yeah. <laughs> just so bizarre, you know, like, and, and certain people that you really sort of get to like you want you want them to be stars or you want them to you know just keep going and sometimes it just doesn't work that way it's there's just no rhyme or reason as far as i can tell for any of it yeah it's weird it's random but it's so it's so wonderful at the same time well yeah sure we love we love to be entertained so i noticed after that movie, it was a while before you did any other um, stuff. What happened during that time? I think that was when I went to New York City. Mm -hmm. And I went to New York because I wanted to, you know, be a great actress. And I ended up getting sort of discovered by a commercial director named Bob Giraldi. Oh, yeah. Really at a phone booth. And, um, I didn't know who he was, but he threw his card at me and he said, you know, um, if you ever want to do commercials, give me a call. And of course, I didn't want to do commercials. I came to New York to be on Broadway mm -hmm. and, you know, wanted to be a serious actress. And I showed my boyfriend the card and he said, what are you nuts? You call this guy immediately. And that kind of changed the course of my career because I ended up doing a lot of national commercials and some of them he directed. And some of them won Cleo's and, you know, it just, it wasn't just money, but it kept me real busy. Like there were weeks I didn't even do laundry. I just have to go buy new clothes, you know, cause I yeah. didn't have time to like wash my underwear. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> oh my God, I'm going to Montauk to shoot a big red commercial. Oh, I'm going to do this Pampers commercial today. Oh, I'm going off to shoot this. I mean, I literally was working nonstop. Never has that been repeated, but that was my twenties was pretty much commercials. And, um, I just had to go through the door that was open, you know. I kept my lessons and I kept studying, but I couldn't say no to the work. And so that's why. That's why there's like a, a schism or whatever, a chasm, <laughs> some <laughs> word with SM in it at the end <laughs> about why I wasn't working steadily. That's That sort of took over. Wow. I remember uh, 
you did the voice of Ray's childhood crush on the real Ghostbusters. That was a great thing because my girlfriend was doing the voice of Janine. Laura? We, we thought we were going to get to work together, but we didn't. I worked separately. But I love, that was super fun. That I was a great gig. I love yeah. Laura Summer. She's awesome. Oh, did you do an interview with her yet? Yeah. We're, uh, we're okay. supposed to do another one. Yeah. Okay, good. She's one of my best friends. So we were hoping that we would get to work together, but it's the way it worked, you know, the way they did it. I just worked <laughs> with uh, Frank Welker, and then she worked another day. You know what I mean? We were in the same room at the same time. Yeah, last fall, I was having a lot of uh, female past guests record these plugs for my show um, where they where they plug my show and then say something inappropriate at the end, right? I wanted her to, I wanted her, I forgot what it was exactly. I wanted her to say in Janine's voice that had fuck in it, right? And she, <laughs> she refused to say that. <laughs> oh, that's really funny. She wouldn't do it? No. She, oh, she, she said, I'll change it to fudge. And then I don't think we got to do it, but I would, I wouldn't have minded if she had said fudge. Oh, that's too funny. Well, maybe it's next time you'll get her to do it. And tell her tell her you spoke to me because this is just so funny because today we yeah. were going to try to have lunch or something, but I told her I, I didn't say your name. I just said I was doing a phone interview. Uh -huh. <laughs> I talked to her later. I mean, we're really good friends. <laughs> anyway, I'll tell her. Yeah, she's a wonderful lady. Oh, love her. Love her, love her. Uh, you did an episode of Murphy Brown. I did, yes. You played a, a uh, relative of Rosemary. sister <laughs> on Murphy Brown. And yep. Rosemary played my mother. And yep. Barney Martin played my father. It was a fantastic gig. And uh, Barnett Kelman directed it, who I've been a big fan of from just theater. I just I thought he was a brilliant director. So that was super fun. Mm -hmm. What was Rosemary like? Oh, well, of course she loved me because she loved my dad. And she's also, you know, a life member of the castle, so we talked magic and stuff like that. And she was terrific, just terrific. Yeah. Uh, I, I heard that her and Mary Tyler Moore did not get along on the Dick Van Dyke show. Oh, really? Yeah, I could not believe that. I was like, wow. I did not know that. I did not know that, Tommy. Yeah. <laughs> wow, how did you hear that? Um, Greg Gilbert. Do you know Greg Gilbert? Not by name, maybe by something else. He's a, he's a podcaster up in Canada. His show's called Py Python's Paradise. Oh, yeah, I think I did his. I think I did his, yeah. Yeah, he was interviewing a historian uh, of, of Mary Tyler Moore, and he mentioned that. I was like, wow. I, I, huh. that's, that's like, you know, um, uh, what's his name from, from I Love Lucy? William Frawley not getting along with the cast. Right, right. Yeah, especially with Vivian Vance. <laughs> God. That's a shame. It's not a shame. It is a shame. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you did an episode of the short-lived They Came From Outer Space. Oh, that was a great show. Those guys were so funny. I don't know what happened to them. They were both fantastic. I mean, I don't know if they're still in show business. Like, you never know if people just take the money and run or, um, you know, if they're writing now or, you know, doing something completely different. But, yeah, I played like a gossip columnist. It was really fun. We shot it in Malibu. That was great. Yeah. Uh, Stuart Fracken, I'm going to reach out to him soon. Um, I know he's still out there. I think he's doing, oh, good. I think he's doing voiceover work, if I'm not yeah, mistaken. Yeah, see, voiceover work you can kind of disappear in because unless people really want to make the effort to get to know who you are doing these voices, you can do all of this work. I mean, it's a fantastic career, and nobody really has to... Uh, Know your face, so you can still go to the supermarket. You know, <laughs> very nice. <laughs> yeah, and Dean Cameron, he lost all his hair, and he's bitter. Oh, <laughs> that happens, huh? Yeah, I try. I tried getting him on the podcast. And he was really funny, though. I have to say, they were they were hysterical together. I mean, they were a really good contrasty kind of team, and could have probably done a lot more stuff if you know. If, 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 I don't know what happened with the show. I don't know if it got canceled or if they quit or, you know, I don't remember any of that stuff. Yeah. I just had fun. That's what I know most. <laughs> <laughs> and Teresa Ganzel was in that episode. She's a dear friend. Teresa's a very good friend of mine. She was in it too. And I see her all the time and she comes to the castle and 
I just had lunch with her and her boyfriend at Musso and Frank's, the oldest restaurant in Hollywood, and I love her to death. I um, I was in the middle of an audition for a play called Viagra Falls, <laughs> and in the middle of the audition, I looked at the director and the writer, and I said, you know who you want for this part? You want Teresa Cancel. <laughs> and they said, who's that? And I went, well, here's her information, and this is her agent, and this is how you contact her. And... She thanked me so much because I basically gave her a gig for five years doing this play, mm -hmm. Niagara Falls, with Lou Cattell and Robert Pine, and then Bernie Coppell went into it. And then one time the show was going to Waterbury, Connecticut, and Teresa had just gotten married or something, mm -hmm. and she didn't want to go, and so she called me and she said, Sarah, would you please do the show in Waterbury, because I really don't want to leave town right now. And so I went off and did it, I think it was in 2007, and did it for two months, and that was a great experience. So we've shared this role, and we're friends to this day. She's just one of the greatest. She's a darling, darling person. Yeah, she told me she'd do the podcast after uh, she, she has something coming out. She's going off to do uh, the female odd couple <clears throat> in North Carolina or South Carolina. Nice, nice. Good yeah. for her. And then I think we're going to be in a web series together, <laughs> Teresa and I. We just did a, before she left town, we did a read-through. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what the final title is going to be, but you'll hear about it because it'll be on the, you know, it'll be on the Facebook Nice. Um, Ken Schreiner is the lead, who's a big soap opera star, and Malcolm Denar, Denar I love Malcolm. might have interviewed. Do you know Malcolm? Yeah, I know Malcolm, yep. He's in it too, and Teresa plays his love interest, and I play the assistant to the head of the studio. It's a Hollywood type thing. Mm -hmm. Really funny. We just did a read-through of it, so I'll be working with Teresa, and that'll be swell. Nice, nice. Malcolm used to date Kelly Maroney back in the day. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty funny. He told me when I interviewed him, yeah, he was like snooping around my Facebook page and stuff. He's like, God, you know so many of my friends. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. Oh, I, you know, I haven't done that. I should do it. I sh are we Facebook friends? Not yet. We should okay. be. Okay, well, we will be. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here's a movie I remember very well that you did called Frozen Assets. You remember that? Really? Oh, wow. That was with um, Terry. Well, Shelley Long was the lead. It was so wonderful. Mm -hmm. And Corbin Burnson. And then the hookers, uh, Terry Copley was the other girl that I worked with the most. And she was on that series. Wasn't she in Bosom Buddies with Tom Hanks and I think so. Terry she, Copley? I remember a lot of stuff she was in, but I don't know if she was on Bosom Buddies. Yeah, I, she was in some series. She was adorable. I don't know what happened to her. She's still around. Have you interviewed her? No, I reached out to her and I didn't hear back and stuff. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Well, that was great. We shot that in uh, Oregon. And um, that's where I had my first Starbucks coffee. I think it was 1990. I'm very bad <laughs> with years, I'll be honest with you and tell you, because I confuse years so badly. But I think it was around 1990 I did that. And uh, Shelly was a friend of mine, mm -hmm. so it was also fun to, you know, work with her. And, and we stayed friends for a long time. I just sort of lost touch with her recently, but I'll, now you've inspired me to give her a call. <laughs> I interviewed her best friend and roommate, Ann Ryerson. Oh, I was just with Ann the other day. It was Sunday. Um, yeah, she lives up the street from me on, on Beachwood. Yeah, I love Ann. She's a lot of fun. She's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. I remember this movie because my parents took me to see a movie, and we I saw the trailer for it, and I, I never forgot it because of seeing that trailer. Oh wow! Yeah, the Frozen Assets trailer. Yeah, was it? it was kind of racy. It was kind of racy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, by, and by this point, you know, Shelley was no longer bankable after Troop Beverly Hills, so this kind of put her acting career in the toilet for a while, as far as yeah. movies go. <laughs> Yeah, I, you know, it's just such a strange career because really, who's, who's more wonderful than her on Cheers mm -hmm. in the world? I mean, she was just everything. She was funny. She was classy. She was beautiful. She had a great figure. You know, she just was everything, I thought. And um, one of the, I did love her in Troop Beverly Hills, but I hear they're remaking Troop Beverly Hills, by the way. Really? Yeah, they're doing a <laughs> remake of it. I've interviewed the director. I wonder if he knows about that. <laughs> mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
you played a uh, nurse in the remake of The Nutty Professor. That was another amazing gig. Um, my friend Alita Chappelle, who had been, I'd known from theater, became a casting director. She worked for Francis Ford Coppola for years, and mm. she cast that film, and I got to play... Uh, the head nurse, when Eddie Murphy is, is going into the hospital and he's taken the potion and he starts, you know, um, blowing up. Yeah. And um, <laughs> I used to wear this perfume oil, Tommy, that I used to make perfume oils. That was like my hobby. And yeah. um, I just remember Eddie Murphy saying to me, what is that shit you got on? You're giving me a hard off. <laughs> When he's on the stretcher, you know, they have him all rigged up so that he can blow up. You know, they have um, tubes up his legs and all kinds of special stuff I don't even understand yeah. that, you know, he would get as big as the room. And so I would have to scream, you know, get me out of here. It was just a day's work. But, man, what a fun day. Yeah. And I worked with that great director. Tom um, Shadyak. Oh, gosh, because he brought me in for Liar Liar. Yeah. Um, God, what's his name? It's like Tom, just, Tom Shadyak. Tom Shadyak, Tom Shadyak, who I really had the biggest crush on. And <laughs> he kind of, you know, went away, you know, got, went off to meditate and sold all his possessions and turned into a kind of guru. Uh, not a guru, a recluse, that's the word I mean, a recluse. Like a Jim Carrey and did, just, too. What a cool person. <laughs> Yeah, Jim Carrey did too. <laughs> yeah, right. Are they buddies? Like, didn't they yeah. do Ace Ventura, Pet Detective? Yeah. There must have been something after that day. <laughs> no, he did. He did Patch Adams with Robin Williams also. Yes, yes. Yeah, he brought me in to do the table read of Liar Liar, and I read the Jennifer Tilly part, and um, nice. I thought, wow, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. A movie star, you know, <laughs> but it was really just to help read because Jennifer couldn't make the table read that day, but I did not know that at the time. Oh my god, I, I okay, I go to Monster Palooza every year in LA, right? Yes, and she was scheduled to be a part of a child's play panel, and um, it was announced that she was not going to be signing autographs with the rest of the uh, cast afterwards, right? A public outcry blew up angry because she wasn't doing that, right? So then yeah. next thing you know, it says that Jennifer Tilly canceled her appearance. And then the day of, it, it's a, it's announced that she's uh, that she's there and she will be signing. And I, I didn't get to go because it was a huge mob of people. Like, I, I, wow. I wouldn't have been able to go <laughs> to that wow. panel. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's a story. Yeah. Craziness. I worked with her. I worked with her on a movie called Goost. Um, I played her sister, Goosed. and um, Alita cast that. The same gal who cast Nutty Professor, and Jennifer was just a fantastic person. I just really liked her. I mean, it sounds like I just like everybody, but you know, mostly people are pretty cool, and unless they're not, and I can't even name anybody that I worked with that I was like, ugh, were they awful? Because you know, generally. Everybody's happy to be working on a set and happy to be on a job. And unless something is really bad, you know, people are usually cool. Yeah. And I like, I like the, the, the original Nutty Professor. It's one of my favorite comedies Oh, yeah, of Jerry all time. Lewis. Fantastic. You really can't top that. Yeah. It's one of those movies I can watch over and over again. I'm a big old movie fan. I just live on, on Turner Classic Movies. I mean, this has been the greatest month, or it has been the greatest month, where <clears throat> they're showing all Oscar-nominated, or Oscar winners, rather, uh, and one movie kind of leads to the next, like Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon. Like, if it's got uh, Humphrey Bogart in it, then the next movie will be something maybe he won for, and then someone else in the cast was up for an award, and that's how they've been scheduling the movies. It's just been the greatest. Mm -hmm. Now we get to Spider-Man, the animated series. How did you get to play Mary Jane? The greatest job of my career. <laughs> I can't really believe it. Um, I auditioned for it. I uh, went in. My agent, uh, my wonderful agent, uh, Tisherman, got me an audition. And I went and read. And I never heard anything. That was like in October. And then a few months later... 
I had another audition of callback, they say, for that, and I went in again and read some other stuff, and I never heard anything. And, you know, generally when you're an actor, you go on auditions, you do your best, and the real art is to forget about it. You know, they're going to call you or not. And if you stew and obsess and worry, it's usually not healthy. So I've learned to just give the gift of my audition and just try to focus on other things. So in May, my dear friend Mary's daddy passed away, and I went to Seattle for the memorial, the funeral, and to be with her and her family. Mm-hmm. And I get a call that I got the part of Mary Jane in Spider-Man. I'm like, what? Now, I auditioned, mind you, in October. This is now May. And, um, like, I had to start work immediately, so I had to come home really fast. And that became a weekly job for quite a few years. It was wonderful. Yeah. Do you like doing voiceover the most? Well, the most, I like acting the most. Let's put it that way. Whether I'm seen or not, it's still acting, as far as I'm concerned, because, you know, you're listening to me talk. There's nothing so extraordinary about my voice that, you know, is so spectacular, but I can do a lot with it because I'm an actor, and I'm a character actor. So I would just say I love acting, but the best part of voiceover, as everyone will tell you, is you don't have to get your hair done, you know. (laughs) It's not like you have to look perfect when you show up on a set, you know, you have to get yourself together voiceover people are a lot more relaxed because it's not about how you look it's about how you sound and that is a wonderful wonderful job it's a great career yeah i have this joke in my stand-up act i say i don't think you're ever going to hear about a voiceover actor having a me too experience because they like to go to the studio naked Oh, God. <laughs> I see you're a stand-up, too. Is that what you do mostly? A little bit. I'm uh, just uh, the open mic. Yeah, I, I, I did a very competitive... Uh, I, I'm in a very competitive era of stand-up comedy. I started in the Bay Area in 2006, uh, where I'm from, and then I've kind of uh, taken a break the last couple of years that I've been up here in Reading because there's really no uh, comedy scene up here. I see. Are there comedy clubs in Reading that you can go, like, try stuff out at? No, there's no there's no comedy scene at all in Reading. So um, where do, what do you do? Where do you go? Do you come down to L.A.? I, um, I, play, I, I did a show at the Ice House a few years ago. Um, but, like, um, I, was, I, I was coming down to the Bay Area every now and then to take care of, of whatever business and seeing friends the last couple of years and stuff. But I've just distanced myself from the, the Bay Area because they're just they're not good people in the comedy scene over there. I see. It's sad. Yeah. Mm-hmm. For Ten years I was up there doing it, and it's you know I was I was doing it for me, and I was doing it as kind of a hobby. And then after my car accident in 2015, I just decided I was going to pursue it and stuff. And I faced a lot of backlash, and. It was just, it was a sad situation. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. But I'll do it eventually. I mean, I'm trying to, I'm trying to move out to L.A. I've been trying for the last 19 years, and just things get in the way every time I'm getting close oh. to it. Yeah. Well, I think that's where you belong. Either that or maybe just be in San Francisco where there must be comedy clubs and stuff there. I think L.A. definitely. No, I'm, I'm done with the Bay Area. You <laughs> are. <laughs> what, what do you think about Sausalito? Sausalito? Um, I mean, it's nice, you know. Um, never really given it much thought. I've never spent a whole lot of time over there. My girlfriend, who's a dancer and has a dance company, is living in Sausalito right now, and she's always telling me I have to come visit, that it's incredible, 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 and I've never been there. Have you been, But have you spent any time there? Not for a long time, but yeah, it's okay. a nice Yeah, well, they have a lot of jazz clubs. I don't know about comedy clubs, but they sure have a lot of jazz clubs. Nice. I like jazz. Yeah, I do, too. I've been studying jazz for seven years. <laughs> <laughs> I've been studying with a jazz singer named Sue Rainey. Have you ever heard of her? Sue Rainey. That's, that's, that name does sound familiar. Yeah, she should look her up. She's just an amazing singer. She's kind of one of those underground people, like the people who know her know her, but not everybody knows her. Yeah. She's had albums since she was like 16 years old. 
Nice, nice. I'll check it out. Check it out. <laughs> Why not? Do you do uh, conventions because of the Spider-Man? You know, I, I've done a couple of Comic-Cons, thanks to Mark Evanier. I don't know, you know who Mark Evanier is, because yeah. of Garfield, right? Yeah. Um, but I haven't done that many, and I know that um, Christopher Barnes, who was Spider-Man, I think he sort of moved on to other things, and, um, <clears throat> you know, I don't know. I don't, John Semper I've stayed very close in touch with, who was the producer and wrote most of the episodes. I don't know if you've ever interviewed him. He's no. wonderful. He comes to see, I do a lot of live theater and sing and dance and do stuff with this act, Biffle and Schuster, and we do shows in town. He comes to everything I do, and um, he and his lady are just big, wonderful people. He's somebody maybe you should talk to, John Semper. John Semper, he's, yeah. um, I mean, do you, do you like to talk to producer writers, too, or just mostly actors? Oh, I talk to writers and producers, too. Yeah, you should you should look him up. He's pretty cool. Um, but no, I haven't done a Comic-Con lately. The uh, last one I did was quite a few years ago. It was the same year that, uh, that's just terrible memory, but um, it was the year that Amy Winehouse died. Oh, um, because I was on the train to San Diego when I heard that news, and I was hysterical because I really, really, really loved her. Mm -hmm. And um, it was just upsetting to me. So it was good I got to go do a Comic-Con and <laughs> get my mind off everything, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, um, when your father passed, um, was it expected? Well, no. I mean, he, look, he was 92. I didn't expect him to live forever, but he, we had just... Uh, you know, he, we just made dinner. Uh, we just had a lovely evening. Uh, you know, he was 92. Basically, I'll tell you the story. It's a pretty amazing story. Mm -hmm. I was staying over at his house, and I was sleeping in the back bedroom where all the magic props were and stuff. And uh, my boyfriend at the time had made us dinner. We had, I remember the exact meal we had. We had salmon, vegetables, and rice. Mm. And he made an apple pie. <laughs> and we had a lovely night, and then uh, he went home, and my dad, you know, I was raised Christian scientist. My parents didn't go to doctors, so my dad wasn't on any medicine or anything, but I got him a medical marijuana prescription. So, you know, we were having a high old time, believe me. So, <laughs> medical marijuana, whatever. And I went to bed. I said, Daddy, I love you. I'm going to bed. It's like 10 o'clock. And around 3 in the morning, I hear this thumping outside, and I jump out of bed and I go, Daddy, are you okay? And he goes, I gotta get out of here. And I said, where do you want to go? He goes, I gotta go home. I go, Daddy, you are home. He goes, nah, 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 can I take this robe with me? And I go, of course you can, it's your robe. And he goes, well, what about my shoes? And I go, Daddy, you don't need any shoes. Oh, I wanna know where my shoes are, they're right there. I said, Daddy, I love you, you're home. I'm so tired, I'm going back to bed. I'll see you in the morning and I kissed him and I went back to sleep. And I woke up around seven and he was sitting on the couch with his robe tied and his shoes on and his hair nicely back. And he'd gone home. Oh. <laughs> I mean, that was that. And um, he knew it. It was freaky. It, it was freaky. I've actually told that story to a spiritual person who mm. said that he's heard that a lot. That sometimes when people are going, they know it. And they're very conscious, and that could very well have been what was going on. And I wish I'd stayed up. I'm sorry I went to bed, Tommy. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe if I'd stayed up, he'd still be here today. <laughs> but um, he had a real good he had a real good run. My mom died much younger. My my mom died at 70, mm -hmm. so my dad was able to last a lot longer only because when she died in 2000 people said to me oh your dad's not going to last long without your mom and I was like you want to bet and I started taking him everywhere I went I, like a golden retriever I just throw him in the car come on dad we're going to WeHo we're going to have a happy hour come on dad we're going to the races come on dad we're going to the castle I just made him go everywhere with me and then he met people and made friends and you know had a pretty good time the last nine years or so Mm -hmm. uh, what, what, so, what, so what did your mom die of? She died of, well, like I said, they were Christian scientists. Um, so, you know, the one joke I ever wrote, I'm not a stand-up, Tommy, but I did write <laughs> this joke. What do you call an old Christian scientist? What? 
Lucky. Lucky. <laughs> Thank you for laughing. Yeah, yeah, my mom pretty much died of everything you could think of. <laughs> she didn't go to doctors. But she was happy. Both my parents died at home in their own house. I was there the, the, both times. I was holding my mom's hand when she breathed her last breath. I, I can't regret anything like that because I was there. I was taking care of them. I was around. I was, you know, they were very good to me my whole life. And so I was there for them. And I'm really glad about that. Oh. As soon as my dad died, my sister and I looked at each other and went, we got to sell this fucking house. We, <laughs> <laughs> both our parents died here. We don't need this house anymore. So we fixed it up and sold it. Oh, that's good, at least. <laughs> <laughs> got rid of that, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Do you have anything new coming up? Well, I'll tell you what I'm doing. Well, I'll tell you the thing I'm the most proud of, and you probably don't even know I did this. I made a documentary film called Troopers, mm -hmm. and I made it with my partner, Dale Lawrence. We used to do a sketch comedy act where we were Tipper and Hillary, mm -hmm. and uh, after that, you know, uh, administration ended, we thought, let's do something easy, like, like make a documentary film, and that took seven years for us to complete. Uh, it's available right now on Amazon Prime. It's called Troopers, T-R-O-U-P-E-R-S, and it's about actors over 80 and 90 who are still pursuing their showbiz dreams. And I'm very, very proud of that. And you can see it. And if you haven't seen it, I want you to watch it because you'll know all the people. It sounds like you really are hip to the character oh, yeah. actors out there. I mean, Marvin Kaplan's in it and Ooh. Harold Gould and my dad Carol and Gould. <laughs> uh, Betty Garrett and uh, Kay Ballard and uh, you've got to watch it. You, you just, you'll just love it. Yeah. So that, that's something that's ongoing. And then I'm doing a show, of, I'm doing a, the kids show with, with Lloyd Schwartz at Theater West. I'm doing The Adventures of Peter Rabbit. I play Nana Bunny on Saturdays at 1 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long-running show. We opened in October. And then a week from Sunday, I'm in a show with the Biffle and Schuster guys. We do uh, comedy and sketches and songs. And that's next Sunday at 7 o'clock at the Lake. Uh, well, it's not called Lake. What's it called? The Coffee House Gallery on Lake in Altadena. And I just did a couple of TV commercials recently. I did uh, Apartments.com with Jeff Goldblum and a Old Navy commercial with Neil Patrick Harris. Wow. <laughs> that's that's going to be great. I hope so. So I'm having a comeback in commercials. <laughs> I'm so happy, you know, because when you're in your 20s, like I was playing mothers of teenagers and stuff, you know, yeah. in my 20s. And now that I'm the age where I could have teenagers, I'm playing all these like cougars, you know. <laughs> it's just kind of fun. <laughs> It's like a whole different world of advertising now, and I'm thrilled. I'm so happy. There's nothing wrong with that. I like cougars. <laughs> and I'm learning magic. That's my other big secret that I can tell the world. I mean, it's going to take forever to learn because it's a practice, you know, but I've been getting some magic lessons. I've had a couple of, you know, I've got two tricks down. I'm sort of, you know, getting that together. <laughs> it takes, boy, you just can't imagine the work it takes. It's like becoming a ballerina. You know, you really have to practice all the time. It's in the blood. <laughs> it, yeah, I think so. Well, my dad, you know, he was a magician as a kid. He, he started, like, he had to support his family at 13, you know, in those days. So yeah. he got it together early. I, I just, uh, I'm doing it for fun and as a hobby right now. I don't think it's ever going to be a career, but it sure is fun. It's a great thing to do, especially if you're, you know, home a lot. <laughs> <laughs> did your dad know the amazing Kreskin? I believe he did. I, he pretty much knew everybody in the magic world. Even though his act was comedy, he really had to know real magic to be able to parody it. And so all the real magicians of the day that were fabulous and famous, they all loved my dad because they loved that somebody could make fun of it in such a fun way, you know, not just be a jerk about it. Mm-hmm. So here comes the fun part, Sarah. There's yes. a there's a game that I like to indulge my guests in. It's oh. and uh, n not n no better time to play it now because uh, we just lost uh, James Lipton, and this is like a James Lipton like uh, questionnaire of like slumber party questions. Oh, okay. Oh. 
and how this works is I ask you the question and you answer it and then you ask me the same question and I answer it. Oh, okay. Sarah, are you ticklish? Uh, yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> are you ticklish, Tommy? I am baby ticklish. <laughs> well, I think people that aren't ticklish are dead. <laughs> I agree. I agree. <laughs> Uh, I've interviewed a lot of people who are alive, maybe like maybe two people I've met who are not ticklish. You know, I'm very ticklish, but I also have one particular Achilles heel that's not an Achilles heel, where I'm especially tick, especially, who am I, especially ticklish. And uh, a friend of mine found that spot, and now every time he sees me, he grabs it, and it's just not nice. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my. What um, is your belly button an innie or an Audi? My belly button is an innie. What is your belly button? It is an innie, and it's very deep. Ah, so you can hide things in there from, you know, the TSAs. Everything from marijuana to a necklace. <laughs> That's hilarious. Uh, what color are your toenails painted? My toenails are currently not painted. I'm giving them a rest. Uh, I have very dark polish <clears throat> on them, and it was very hard to get it off, and now I'm enjoying their actual shade of nude. Are your toenails <laughs> painted? <laughs> not right now. Last time they were, they were uh, purple with sparkles. Oh, that's nice. I like that. Festive. Yeah, yeah I, I usually have my toenails done, but I just got everything off, and I'm giving them a breather. Yeah, I like the, the elaborate colors. It's fun. Yeah. Uh, what would you say is your best personality trait? Uh, my best personality trait is that I'm upbeat and fun-loving. <laughs> I agree. People laugh mostly. Uh, what would you say is your best personality trait? Probably my sense of empathy. Mm, mm, well, that's a wonderful quality. Mm -hmm. It sure is. It is. And then, it's a very good quality to have. Yes, it is. And then my favorite question, is there a stinky smell that just makes you gag? Uh, mm, yes, uh, there are several. I, frankly, if anyone throws up, chances are I will throw up immediately. That's a popular one, yeah. <laughs> yeah, if, I, if someone throws up near me, I will throw up. Um, uh, a smell that I, I've grown to love, actually, is skunk, because we have a lot of skunks where I live in the hills, and I've, go, I've grown to like it. Um, do you have a smell that makes you gag? Uh, either farts or feet. Feet? Either farts or feet. Oh, farts or feet. Yeah, you know, I haven't smelled many bad farts lately, to be honest with you. Wow. <laughs> I guess I've been one of the lucky ones. Uh, and in yoga, I used to smell feet a lot, but I haven't been doing yoga lately. And generally, the people are, because they're very conscientious, because their feet are bare, you know, mm -hmm. to have clean feet. But yeah, I would imagine that's pretty bar feet. <laughs> I remember, yeah, when I was in the hospital, um, the last month I was there, um, I, they did not, they, I was very grumpy. They did not go uh, and change my socks. And so I had very bad athlete's foot for about six months. And that was ooh, the worst ooh. ever. Now, did you tell me what your accident was? I don't, I don't remember. If you did, please yeah. tell me again. It was a car accident. Basically, what happened was me and this guy, who is, is no longer a friend of mine, oh. uh, we, got in, um, we were coming back from the city of San Francisco drinking. Um, he fell asleep at the wheel. I fell asleep in the passenger seat. We ended up in the middle of the road okay. But then uh, we got out of the car and then a car collided with ours, and then the impact hit us both, and I got the worst of the injuries. Oh, my God. Oh, oh, it's oh, awful. Yeah. It was very profound in my life, and it's it, if it wasn't for that, you know, I wouldn't be talking to you right now or even be pursuing show business. This changed the course of your, of your life. It sure has. Wow. Yeah. Well, I hope you're okay now. Is everything good? Yeah, I mean, uh, they told me, you know, I was going to get serious depression from the trauma, and I have, and so I'm in the middle of uh, losing weight because I, I gained a lot of weight, 
that I was supposed to keep off, and I've lost 24 pounds so far. Are you doing, like, the keto diet or any particular kind of diet? A little bit of keto, yeah. I'm doing a little bit of everything. Keto, Atkins. Uh, my big, my biggest thing is, and it works, is no sugar. Yeah. And I walk, you know, at least 25, 30 minutes a day um, on the treadmill that we have in our, in our apartment gym. And um, I just, you know, limit my portions and all that stuff. Okay. Well, you're doing everything right. I mean, I don't think it should be extreme, but, you know, they, they, they say never eat anything bigger than the palm of your hand. <laughs> <laughs> that's what a meal size should, should be. Never and heard. I find even for me, that's a really good guideline to not overeat and just, you know, keep everything in proportion. Yeah, I never heard that that uh, expression before. But yeah, see if that you know if it resonates with you. Listen, you know my girlfriend years ago gave me the motto, and it's on my fridge: nothing tastes as good as thin feels. And as corny as that is, it really works, and it's really true. You know, when you we weigh having a big hot fudge sundae with being able to get into your jeans and you know have them be comfortable. That feels better. That just feels better. And then, of course, sometimes it doesn't matter. You just don't give a shit. But yeah. <laughs> so in general, it's uh, it's good to have sort of a guideline for how to be. Well, I, I had a I had to go on a diet in 2006 uh, when I was 23 uh, because um, my cholesterol was just take, taking over my heart, and it was oh. really bad. And back then, it was easier for me to lose weight, not only because I was young, but also because I didn't have metal in my leg. And I could exercise a lot more and stuff. And I lost it all in just under a year. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, so this is going to be, this is going to take a lot longer, but I'm, I'm ready for it. Because Good. I don't ever want to be overweight again after this. Oh, that's great. Well, that's the other thing. The mindset is really, you know, that really puts it over the top. Is just to go, you know, enough. I've had it. You have to reach that place sometimes to really make a difference you know, and make a change. So mm -hmm. glad to hear it. Very glad to hear it. Thank you so much. And I have a really funny joke to tell you. Oh, goody. Okay. Mm. Love it. You know the difference between a golf ball and a G-spot? Um, uh, you can hit a golf ball? <laughs> it takes a man 20 minutes to find the golf ball. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's great. That's hilarious. I was trying to get it. I was trying to guess it, but... Well, you were close. <laughs> I was close. I was close. That's great. <laughs> well, Sarah, thank you so much for coming on today. Thank you so much for finding me and having me. I, I'm a, I've got a friend you on Facebook because we have so many um, friends in common, and I will, uh, I, I, will look, I will look you up today. And if you ever get down to L.A., please know the, mad, the castle awaits you. Well, I, 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 it's a members-only club. <laughs> yeah, but I'm a member, and I can invite you. Oh, that would be wonderful. I want... You just have to bring a suit. <laughs> just bring, a, you know, some formal clothes, and I can get you in. Yeah, I'm going to be down there for a week in May. As, oh, so... good. Well, make, be sure you contact me. I mean, look, Daniel Ulan is a member, too. We're all members, but, um, yeah. you know, just let somebody know, and then we can arrange to get you in, all right? All right. Well, okay. I'm, I got so much things that I want to do that week because I'm going to uh, Monster Palooza and the Hollywood Show, right? But oh, cool. I am, I'm going to be meeting up with guests and stuff, and I just there's so many people who want to see me. I'll see if I can if I can fit it in. Oh, okay. Well, only if you want to. God knows it's not required. I just thought if it's fun for you. And, you know. Oh yeah, I would. I would love to go see a magic show. I haven't been to an actual live magic show in my life. Well, there's so much going on, and there's so many great, you know, magicians now. And the club is, if you've never been to the club, the whole club is fantastic. There's five performance rooms, there's five bars, incredible food, everyone's gorgeous. You know, it's just really fun. Yeah. <laughs> You'll have a great time, I guarantee it. Okay, I'll, I'll let you know. All right, do that. And it was great talking to you, Tommy. Thank you so much for oh, finding me. Oh, you too. Yes, and you're a lot of fun. You're such a sweet lady. And Oh, thank you. Thank you. And I'm so glad you like my dad because that means a lot to me, you know? Yes, he, there's no one like him. And you have yourself a wonderful and blessed day. Thank you. And you the same. Be careful out there in the world. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. <laughs> Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. 
Sarah Ballantyne. Ain't she a sweetheart? Wonderful lady, humble lady. Great stories about her and her dad and her mother. That is just so wonderful. It's great to hear about show business families that love each other and get along. Um, if you like this video, everyone, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Add me as a friend on Facebook. Join my Tommy Kovac Comedian page on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram and all that fun stuff. Well, that's all the time we have this week on Splat from the Past. Until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Fire, dudes!